Where do you begin a new engine? With a new factory? With technology? With engineering? We want a lighter weight engine with power output comparable to the six liter. A new engine can begin years before you can start to build the place that puts it together. If we can lighten the engine and reduce its physical size, we can make changes in the way a car feels and rides. Engine size and engine weight affect more than power and performance. Emissions. Fuel efficiency. Where does a new engine begin? First in the mind of man and woman and in the need for quiet, dependable power at a prescribed performance level from a relatively small package. A V8 has certain inherent balance characteristics. A new engine begins on clean paper. There is no mandate to save portions of the current engine design. From this clean paper may come new attention to the function of each engine component, to the quality of design, to how it will be built and duplicated with uniform quality, to how it will be serviced during the long years of its life. From video displays come the mind of the computer extending the mind of the human, calculating quicker and remembering more, but held and directed by the human operator and the human programmer. This machine, for example, was used to analyze driveline vibrations that result from the natural resonance of all things, including parts of cars. From analysis came small alterations to dampen these frequencies and reduce their amplitude. In effect, this machine spent a year to create nothing in search of smoothness in a jungle of natural vibrations. To you, that nothing is quietness as you drive. Designing a new engine is an awesome-sized job. This engine was designed hand-in-glove with the extraordinary plant that is building it. First, the plant grew three times to 750,000 square feet. And the plant performed in computer simulations long before the first steel tower was bolted in place. Computer graphics moved the furniture around setting up assembly lines, taking them down, evaluating and measuring for the best way to route the line, the best places for the machines, and the automated storage racks that serve them. In the computer room of this plant, you can see the computer graphic result of all those decisions as each machine is drawn in place on the line. Except here and now, the purpose is monitoring. Basically, for every machine out there, you can get an overall picture. You can also get an individual machine and see what status it's in, how it's performing compared to how it should be performing. In the case of a machine that's off, we'll not just show this information, but we'll show if maintenance has been called. If they were called, have they dispatched somebody out to the machine? When did they dispatch somebody out there? You could see who specifically should be working on the machine. It's pretty slick. Every foreman also has access to this computer through computer readout terminals in their offices. Although the computer is a significant presence, the computer does not run this plant. This is not an automatic factory. And while many machines have specific automated functions, there are only three true robots working here. Two work on exhaust manifolds, moving the raw castings through necessary machining stations. Later, they'll be sent on their way by conveyor. As the computer extends the mind of man, the computer and the programmable tools in this plant extend the hands of man, adding muscle, stamina, and precision. This plant is a cooperative interaction between teams of workers and teams of special machines. All of them thinking about the job of building this engine, the heart of the Cadillac HT4100 DFI power system, the 4.1 liter 90 degree digital fuel injection V8. Here's how it starts. The block, a casting of lightweight alloy, deep skirt for rigidity and quietness. Between the time the block arrives as a casting and leaves as a full-fledged engine, it will be washed, drilled, honed, tipped, turned, bolted, and filled with moving parts. Block washing here, instead of the traditional car wash like conveyor, puts each casting on a carousel that turns this way and that to receive planned and directed sprays that clean it out. 
Other washers do other parts like the crankshaft. This machine verifies the integrity of the block by filling each cylinder cavity with high pressure air and checking for leaks. Green means go. It's within the specs. This machine cuts the crankshaft and the camshaft bores. It gauges its own work and reports the results. It also measures the wear on its own cutting tools. To maintain standards, it will compensate for normal wear by moving the tool. It tells you what it's done on its light display. If the tool is not replaced, the machine will turn itself off rather than attempt to do substandard work. This machine smooths the cylinder and cuts the shoulder that holds the gray iron bore insert. Like many others, it's equipped with a data entry station. The machine operator can use this to call for a tool change or maintenance or to indicate the status of the machine. Gray iron bores are inserted by hand into each cylinder. These are the walls on which the piston rides. They have each been honed twice to reduce piston friction. Individual pistons are matched to individual bores for a more precise fit. Pistons, in turn, are dimensionally matched to individual wrist pins and connecting rods. The pistons are also made of lightweight alloy and will be fitted with three rings to control compression and oil. The sump or dish, machined in the top of the piston, which complements the dome in the cylinder head, along with the spark plug now positioned near at the center, promotes quicker combustion of the air-fuel mixture. This, in turn, promotes better emission control. This is the piston room, a sealed environment all its own. This is a parts silo, here filled with incoming pistons. It's typical of the parts holding delivery silos throughout the plant. Another characteristic of this engine is the separate valve lifter carrier, a sophisticated lightweight alloy casting that is bolted to the block by this machine. Bolts are delivered by air pressure to spindles that tighten them to a specific torque reading, which is then reported here, which gives the operator a light reading on each individual bolt. Engine assembly is done on two lines, face down on one for work that must be done from the bottom, or face up for work that must be done from the top. On both assembly lines, each engine rides on its own pallet, and these can be switched like railway cars to any specific points the engine has to go. On the face down line, the camshaft is installed by this machine. The camshaft has very tight tolerances, and must be inserted with great precision. The block raises up. The mechanical arm on the other side comes through the hole, engages the camshaft, and while rotating it, pulls it back through. And when the camshaft has reached the final home position, the arm continues to rotate it until the timing indicator on the cam lines up with the timing indicator on the crankshaft. Like many other machines in the plant, this one is programmable. Included in here is a small solid state control device that can be programmed and read by a portable display terminal. Furthermore, the programmer talks in conventional electrical symbols instead of computerese, so it can communicate with plant electricians in their own professional language. The cylinder head is bolted to the block on the face up line. The head is a gray iron casting traditional material, but a newer, lighter design. Cast into it are large coolant passages around the spark plugs, valve seats, and exhaust guides to complement the cooling chambers cast into the block. The machine that bolts the head in place not only measures the torque on the bolts, but also the tension on the threads themselves, sensing that optimum point of clamping that engineers plot as a curve. There are 10 bolts with a total clamping load of 100,000 pounds per head. The intake manifold is lightweight alloy, and it, in turn, is bolted to the head. This machine makes gaskets out of room temperature vulcanizer, RTV. It is programmed to apply a bead around the oil pan. A similar machine does the same for the rocker covers.
At the end of the second assembly line is the engine component verification station. All the emissions-related components have barcodes on them. Distributor, EGR valve, throttle body. A barcode reader comes in, reads the engine type, and reads the corresponding emission components. And it prints out a label that says this is an OK engine. And if it's not an OK engine, then it prints out a reject label and tells you what has to be repaired. If it's an OK engine, it goes to what may be the biggest wonder of all in this plant so full of wonders, the hot test line. Each pallet on the hot test line has its own magnetic code number, which is read at various points by magnetic readers. The pallet number is given to the computer with information entered by the operator. Engine serial number, the type of engine, and the emissions, California, federal, or whatever. The computer remembers this. The engine systems are hooked up to the pallet so that when the engine reaches the test stand, the only thing needing to be connected is the pallet. When the engine reaches the test stand, the magnetic reader sends its number to the computer. The engine, in effect, says, Who am I? The computer responds by saying, You are a California engine, and these are your specs. The engine is now tested against its own personal set of specs with both the test operator and the computer watching the results. We run three modes. Check the integrity of the oil cavity, coolant cavity, and fuel cavity. Oil pressure, torque, breakaway torque, exhaust pressure, manifold vacuum, timing, coolant temperature sensor, the throttle sensor. In the third mode, when we're running 3,000 RPM, 75% of design load, we'll check individual cylinders, exhaust pressure, intake pressure, crankcase pressure, and power contribution per cylinder. The computer stores the test results as a record on each engine by serial number. If there are retests, the computer stores the last five tests. When the engine passes, it goes to shipping, to the warehouse, and eventually to your Cadillac. If something is not up to specification, the engine and pallet are routed to cold test. The engine is not run here, although it can be mechanically turned. The cold test station has a link with the computer. The operator enters the serial number of the engine, and the computer responds with the original specifications and the result of the hot test to provide people with the data they need to diagnose and correct the engine's problem. The engine will then be retested before shipping. So when the engine works so well for you, it's no surprise. We knew it would, and so did the computer. The 4.1 liter DFI 90 degree V8 engine, the heart of the Cadillac HT4100 power system. Lighter, smaller, with emission systems designed into it, with digital fuel injection controlled by an onboard computer. Designed to provide consistent, smooth operation, and mated with a drivetrain to sustain Cadillac performance. Built by teams of thinking people and thinking machines. We call it high technology, but we hope you'll call it just another pleasant Cadillac experience.